Hi, my name is Dr. Sandeep Sonone and I'm a spine surgeon from Mumbai. Today we are going to have a look at the anterior retropharyngeal approach which can be used for either the release or fixation in fixed atlantoaxial dislocations. When we talk of an anterior release, we have two options, either the transaural approach or the retropharyngeal approach. The indications can be fixed or irreducible atlantoaxial dislocations which are associated with severe contracted structures anteriorly. It could be the ligaments or the bones with bony anomalies or it could be one of those dysplastic atlantoaxial dislocations which is associated with severe bony anomalies not only posteriorly but also anteriorly with bony fusion which prevents the relocation of the odontoid back into the C1 arch. Relative indications could be vascular anomalies. We all know there is a 25% chance of vascular anomaly at the C1-C2 joint complex. So it could be anomalies like the fenestrated artery or the high riding vertebral artery which has got an abnormal course or extension introsciously in the C2 body which sort of hinders the posterior fixation. Now we know in long-standing atlantoaxial dislocations because of the duration of the condition the structures on the anterior aspect of the C1-C2 joint complex which is the concave side are severely contracted. These could be muscles like the longus coli or the facet joint capsules or they could be dysplasia in the bone itself. Also the retroodontoid ligaments that is the alar ligaments, the apical ligaments and the transverse ligaments are severely contracted which prevents the or hinders the reduction of the C1-C2 joint complex. Now when we are doing the decompression we release the anterior contracted structures which is the longus coli and the facet joint capsules along with removal of the bony osteophytes. That causes a reduction of vertical translation. It also distracts the joint and reduces the basilar invagination. That is the tip of the odontoid into the foramen magnum. We can also use the middle column as a hinge which is the strong contracted ligaments. And Using this as a hinge, we can compress posteriorly and correct the C1-C2 joint kyphosis which is very very important. And both these things that is reduction of the basal invagination and correction of the C1-C2 kyphosis gives a very good reduction and aligns the C1-C2 joint complex which is good for the spinal cord. There are certain zones that we need to be aware of while using this approach. So we need to identify the C1 anterior arch, the C2 body that is the anterior aspect and the C1, C2 facet joints along with the attachments on these bony structures. The first thing that we need to identify is the C1 anterior tubercle moving distally the anterior aspect of the C2 body, the anterior inferior aspect of the C2 body because many a times the odontoid is hidden deep because of the kyphosis. If we are planning only a release, then simple incision in the longus coli on the attachment of the inferior aspect of the C1 anterior arch is good enough. However, if we are planning a release and plating or instrumentation, then we need to expose the whole of C1 lateral masses because that is where the plates are going to sit. We need to either incise or excise the longus coli muscle. Moving inferiorly, we need to identify the facet joints, the anterior aspect of the facet joints, release the ligaments, taking care not to go too far laterally because of the presence of vertebral artery and then moving inferomedially, gradually landing onto the C2 body. Now there are certain zones which we need to avoid. One of them is the inferior body of the C2 lateral mass. Here you can see that the vertebral artery is present at a distance of around 6 to 10 millimeters just inferior to the tip of the C2 lateral mass or the superior articular process. Another area is the area which is immediately lateral to the C1 C2 joint complex. Hence, it's important not to touch or release the lateral capsule of the C1 C2 joint complex because that is the capsule which is protecting the vertebral artery. So it's important to identify the zones which 
you are supposed to work on and also important to identify the zones to avoid while doing the dissection or exposure. Now the approach would cover the positioning of the patient, the preoperative identification of the various landmarks on x-ray, the approach and the soft tissue release along with the bony resection and finally the realignment and fixation options. The position of the patient is supine on a headrest. Avoid heavy traction because in presence of kyphosis, excessive traction can actually compromise the cord. Also avoid hyperextension in this approach without doing a proper release because if there are bony anomalies, then that can put additional pressure on the cord in presence of hyperextension. Preoperative identification of landmarks is very important. So we need to identify the C2 body, the anterior margin, the C1 anterior arc, demarcate the space between C1 C2, the C2 spinous process and the C1 arch and the occiput. These are the landmarks which will give us intraoperative assessment of the reduction after we have done the release. Preoperative identification of landmarks on x-rays is important. The angle of the mandible because that will give us the ease of reaching the C1-C2 joint complex and also the angulation which is required for superior retraction of the jaw. So if it is too much of kyphosis then probably we are going to need a lot of superior retraction of the jaw to reach the C1-C2 joint complex. Now the skin incision is pretty much a longitudinal one because we need a fair amount of retraction superomedially and if you take a transverse incision then retraction superiorly becomes a bit of an issue. So the line joining the angle of the mandible with the sternal notch is the incision a long longitudinal one. Now once you take the incision I usually start from the distal part of the dissection so it's pretty much the anterior approach that we employ uh, you, we use in the uh, subaxial spine and uh, reach the, uh, uh, the, the pre uh, vertebral fascia through this approach. The proximal dissection is usually done in two stages. First we need to dissect off the deep plane. So I use a roller pack and insert it below the pre tracheal pre vertebral fascia right up to the C1 arch and confirm it on the CRM image intraoperative. Other part of dissection that is the superficial dissection in the proximal part of wound is uh, carried out very very meticulously. There are small feeders, small bleeders uh, which usually cross this path and it's important to coagulate them. Uh, the superior thyroid artery is uh, uh, ligated. Most of this exposure is inferior to the hired bone. The posterior belly of diagastric is identified and care is taken to stay inferior to it. As you can see over here, the superior thyroid artery is well dissected and ligated. The proximal dissection, the deeper part of it is extremely difficult. Important not to retract the deeper structure superiorly, otherwise you are going to put a significant pressure on the oropharynx but to retract all these structures anteriorly. So once I reach the retromandibular space, I use a Dewar's retractor and retract the whole thing anteriorly, lift all the tissues proximally and then try to identify the C1 arch. So the first point is to feel the anterior tubercle of C1 by finger dissection and make sure that you dissect the pre-vertebral fascia up to that level slowly taking care to stay in the midline again there are multiple feeders which cross the anterior aspect in this particular plane it's important to identify these feeders or vessels and uh, coagulate them once a proper plane is made up to the C1 arc then the demarcation of longus coli on either side of C1 arc is carried out. The C1 arch is marked and then confirmed on the C arm image 
so that's the c1 arch which i have exposed as i said a longitudinal incision definitely helps puts less pressure on the soft tissues which are retracted medially quite severely the next sequence is following the c1 arc laterally onto the c1 lateral masses on either side the right and left exposing the lateral margin of the longus coli while cutting the longus coli care is taken not to cut it blindly right up to the lateral margin so i usually go in laterally use a curved so uh, a curved forceps or a curved hemostat hook the longus coli from the lateral to the medial aspect and then cut the longus coli muscles so at all particular at all times you are protecting the lateral margin of the longus coli just lateral to which is the presence of the vertebral artery so it is always a piecemeal cutting of the longus coli uh, making sure that your vertebral artery is protected all the time going on to the lateral masses then we move on inferiorly onto the c2 body usually this is the area which is the most easiest to identify you can move on laterally from the c2 body onto the c2 lateral bosses making sure not to venture too far inferiorly on the c2 lateral mass to avoid injury to the vertebral artery the next step is exposure of the lateral masses of the c1 body so following the c1 anterior arc moving proximally around 5 to 8 mm and laterally around 1.5 to 2 cm we expose the c1 lateral mass again taking care not to go lateral to it then next step is exposure of the c2 body in the center or in the midline that is by gradual coagulation of the medial edge of the longus coli the muscles are reflected off the body of c2 gradually till we reach the c2 c3 disc space so exposure of the inferior part of the c2 body is always easier because of the presence of kyphosis because the odontoid or the tip of the odontoid is deep into the cavity hidden well below the c1 arch on which lies the soft tissue uh, or fibrous tissue between the c1 c2 joint once you do that then once you expose the c2 body then we can move proximally subperiosteally exposing the junction of the odontoid with the c2 body at the same level moving laterally to expose the tip of the c2 uh the c2 lateral mass the undercutting of the c1 arch is done to expose the odontoid tip or the dens a lot of soft tissue or fibrous tissue which lies in between is removed as you can see in this particular video the beauty of this approach is that you need not excise the c1 arch to reach the dens because of the inherent angulation of which is given by the approach you can very easily undercut the 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 posterior margin of the c1 uh, tubercle to reach the tip of the dens now once the soft tissue is removed then the midline compression is taken care of and we can safely move on to the lateral part of the dissection which is the c1 c2 facet joints the c1 c2 facet is usually exposed by following the lateral mass of the c1 uh, body inferiorly if required the anterior osteophytes are removed which overhang this particular joint in presence of severe kyphosis the sequence is removal of the anterior or incision in the anterior aspect of the joint removing all the osteophytes the soft tissues the disc which lies the cartilage disc which lies between the c1 c2 facet joint the lateral margin of the c1 c2 facet joint or the capsule is kept intact which is the sequence all throughout the procedure so that's the left facet joint which has been released the anterior capsule is excised the osteophytes are removed extreme care is taken 
while incising the posterior capsule because of the presence of the posterior epidural plexus on the C2 parts overlying the posterior margin of the C1 C2 facet joints. So, if the instruments venture too far posteriorly in the space, there is going to be a lot of bleeding which is pretty difficult to control via the anterior approach. So, that is the complete facet which is totally supple. Similar release is carried on the opposite side. Again here you can see that the facet is completely released, supple. The lateral capsule is intact. The posterior capsule is incised if not excised and once the complete anterior soft tissue is released then in most cases the we, we should be able to achieve partial reduction of the dense back into the C1 uh, arc. In resistant cases there is presence of osteophytes anteriorly especially in dysplasia of the facet joints which we usually encounter in congenital cases. Important to refashion these joints by removing the osteophytes, excising the overhang and then approaching the joint. In most of these cases, I usually insert a tricortical graft which has a dual purpose. One, it keeps the C1, C2 facet joint distracted which reduces the basilar invagination and the second and the most important part is that the graft is placed in the C1, C2 facet which is the weight bearing column. So, the graft is placed in compression as opposed to the graft on the posterior aspect which is in tensile mode and this graft in compression mode enables a good fusion. Instrumentation is optional in most of these cases which we have got away with a proper release just an anterior release and instrumenting posteriorly. In few cases plating is an option or an anterior transarticular screw is an option which has to be decided preoperatively. So, that is the plate on the right side and the plate on the left side that is the complete instrumentation on either side. In most of the acquired cases more often than not this is good enough. However, in congenital cases additional posterior instrumentation might be required that is the preoperative and the postoperative x-ray which shows good reduction of the C1, C2 joint complex. Similarly, anterior transarticular screws can be used in these cases wherever they are feasible which compresses the whole construct anteriorly and aids in fusion. So, to summarize it is a good approach the anterior approach which helps in good release, it helps in reduction, correction of kyphosis but and it definitely reduces the stress which is placed on the posterior implants. In few cases primary anterior fixation is an option especially in resistant cases and in dysplastic cases. So, thank you very much for watching this video and if there are any queries, you can reach out to me on drsandeep72 at yahoo.com. Thank you.